Today we're going to talk about Venus and Mars, one of the most famous paintings by Sandro Botticelli. And yes, that is the Sandro in the Netflix Medici. So Venus and Mars is all about an affair. Venus is the Roman goddess of love and marriage, and Mars is the Roman god of war. But they're having an affair because Venus is already married to the Roman god of blacksmiths, Vulcan. And Vulcan actually catches them in the act by making a web of really small chains, because he's a blacksmith, and throwing it over them. But they're so involved in their love that they don't notice and they're caught. This picture is obviously before all of that happens and it's straight after they've just made love. Now they're both lying down but they're in very different positions. Venus is sitting quite upright and she's dressed in white which shows that she's quite a pure and respectable woman and she's also wearing her hair as jewellery which makes it look almost impossible for her to take her dress off which is quite strange because you probably wouldn't be wearing a dress if you just had sex anyway. But that aside, she's also showing a side profile with her head and that is quite reminiscent of classical emperors and royalty basically. So it's suggesting that she's of high noble birth and she's also very pure, she's wearing white. Whereas Mars on the other hand, he is lying back and he's actually snoring. So there's a lot of audio going on in this picture. Not only is he snoring, but he's also got wasps in his ears and he's got all of these baby putty or cherubs as they're sometimes called, playing with his armour, blowing up that massive horn that's made out of a shell in his ear. So there's a lot of noise going on and yet here he is sleeping through. Something to note is that the lance and the shell are possibly meant to represent sexual organs. So even though he's got a shell being blown in his ear and it doesn't take much imagination to work out what body part a shell's meant to be, he does not wake up. So he's completely immune to Venus's charms, which is maybe why she's looking a bit annoyed. Florence was also really obsessed with becoming more like ancient Greece and ancient Rome. That's because they were experiencing something called Neoplatonism when they looked back to those classical times and although they were very religious and they believed in God, they also thought that the Romans and Greeks had got it right in terms of almost everything else. They loved their philosophers, they loved their art, their architecture, their education. So that is why there's a lot of Greek and Roman imagery. And in fact, this painting is meant to represent Alexander the Great's wedding to one of his wives, Roxana. It's almost a direct copy because there's a poem by a Greek poet called Lucian um, talking about two cherubs or putty that are playing with a lance at the wedding and also one that's hiding in the breastplate. So that's clearly almost exactly the same as what's happening in this picture. It's also worth considering where this painting would go in the house. So it's thought that it would go in the camera, which is both the bedroom, but it's also the entertaining room. In this time, Florentines would usually have this bedroom for consummating the marriage, having children, but they probably wouldn't sleep in it together every night. But they'd also entertain guests there, so it would be really important people they were trying to impress. Now this work is basically probably part of a dowry, or it would be made to welcome the new bride to the house. Let's just look up what a dowry is. So a dowry, as it says on Google, is an amount of property or money brought by a bride to her husband on their marriage. So what would usually happen would be that the bride's parents would give her a dowry, she'd put it in a chest that either her husband or her parents would give her, and it would be covered in paintings of how to be a good wife. Now this painting of Venus and Mars is likely to be in a spalliera, so that was basically like a headboard for the chest. So it would have usually gone at about shoulder height, that's what spalliera means, is shoulder in Italian. So she would have had it at as a headboard for the chest, or it sometimes was used as a headboard for the bed. And the bed, as I've just said, would be used to make children on, or it would be used to entertain guests. So it was a bit like a sofa. It was also thought that if women looked at really beautiful things like paintings or beautiful men or beautiful babies, then hopefully they would give birth to a male heir, which obviously was the aim of the game back in Florence. Now it's time to talk a bit about the symbolism in the painting. For the Renaissance period, there was a lot of symbolism in paintings. Lots of these plants would have hidden meanings and they would be well known by sort of an illiterate population. So they would possibly communicate some ideas 
if someone couldn't read, they'd maybe know what a plant meant instead of having to be able to read words. So to begin with our plants, there's the myrtle, and that is a plant meaning fidelity. So it's often seen in wedding paintings, and as we've sort of discussed before, it's a bit of a confusing message because whilst this painting is intended to show an adulteress, Venus has committed adultery on her husband Vulcan, it's also showing her wifely virtues. This is an allegorical painting though, and the main message of the painting is to show that women have power over men, and it would be to make the woman feel more comfortable in her home. So although it's all about adultery, it's sort of taken with a bit of a pinch of salt. They are gods. Obviously the mortals are expected to be faithful, and even in Venus's demure expression, in her anger with Mars, the way she's dressed, she's very chaste, she's very pure, and that's the sort of attributes that people would want to see in their wives. And that's also why it would be displayed in the camera, the public bedroom, where everyone would get to see that my wife is both sensual, but she's also virtuous and therefore a really good wife, and that's where the myrtle comes in. Next up, it's the laurel plant, and that is literally linked to Lorenzo de' Medici. So as we talked about before, he was almost the ruler of Florence. He wasn't quite, but he was extremely influential in this time, and the name laurel and Lorenzo are very closely linked. Also, I think the laurel wreath is also connected with victors or victorious people in the Roman Empire, so he's shown as a victor and an emperor, which would have suited him perfectly well. Next up is one which hasn't been around in common circulation and hasn't been associated with this painting for very long. In 2010, David Bellingham, who is an art historian at Sotheby's, found that this fruit at the very bottom right of the picture, which is being offered to us by one of the satyrs, is actually a thorn apple, devil's snare, or even poor man's acid, and it's basically a drug. It's a hallucinogenic drug, has the effect somewhere between alcohol and opium, and it's thought to be quite similar to LSD in the effects it has. So this symbol is quite strange. It's essentially implying that Venus has drugged Mars, but in a more literal term, I think it means that Venus, the woman, has power over Mars, the man. Could be symbolic of being drunk in love, being part of a love potion. It's sort of open to interpretation. There is some scepticism about this interpretation though, because the thorn apple or devil's snare probably wouldn't have been prevalent in Renaissance Florence during that time. It's traditionally from North America. There is some acknowledgement that it's mentioned in Greek and Roman poetry. Who knows how, but yes, it's possible they did know about it. Another suggestion for this plant is that it's an aloe plant, and that would mean that it's also got some sort of sexual enhancing powers and it's also meant to ward off bad spirits. So either way you look at it, there's definitely some meaning to it. The reason why David Bellingham decided that he thought it was a sort of evil fruit was because he had been looking at the putty and usually putty are like cute little angels in paintings, you can see them in all these different paintings, they're often sort of derived from angels and they're really usually quite sweet little children quite chubby children often, but in this painting they're not. They look quite evil and they're almost devilish with their little horns and their furry bottom halves. So he thought that it must have some relevance to the fruit that they're brandishing, trying to offer up to Mars and the audience. He decided there was more devilish work at play. And something else that he really interestingly defined, with Renaissance paintings, there's a lot of different interpretations. As I said before, lots of people wouldn't have been able to read, so this would have been a way of showing different ideas and also a way of boosting people's ego a lot of the time because they'd get lots of different references. Bellingham thinks that this painting might not only show Mars and Venus, but is also a direct quotation to Mary Magdalene and Christ. So Mary Magdalene was obviously the prostitute, and Christ, um, when he's been taken off the cross, there's a lot of paintings that show a very similar pose. He's sort of slumped over, and he's in a very cross-like position. So that is quite possibly the case, and again, it shows a woman's power over a man. And it could also show Adam and Eve. In the Bible, in Genesis, it never specifies which fruit was taken from the tree. When it's translated from the Latin, they translate it as an apple, but the original text apparently didn't specify whether it was an apple, a fig, 
or a grape for that matter. In Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, for example, it's depicted as a fig, so that's really interesting. And here Bellingham suggests that it could possibly be this thorn apple, so it could be a sort of sensuous temptation fruit that Eve has presented to Adam, or Venus to Mars in this case. Another little piece of imagery that you should be aware of is the Vespucci sign. So these wasps in the ear, there could mean two different things. The love child of Venus and Mars is Cupid, and Cupid is often shown with bees. For example, this very famous Cranach painting, Cupid complaining to Venus, who is obviously his mother. And this shows sort of the sting of love, the pain that comes with love, that's meant to be quite commonly associated with the bee. So this painting is all about falling in love and it could have that association. Another interpretation is that this painting was made for Vespucci family and their symbol was a wasp. As you can see from this earlier painting by Botticelli, he painted St Augustine in his study and this was definitely for the Vespucci family because you can see their heraldry which has got a wasp on it. In Medici, it's shown that Giuliano and Simonetta have an affair and that this painting is based on them. But is that true? We know already that it was based on Alexander the Great and his wife, Roxana. But was it based on Giuliano and Simonetta? It's unlikely is the answer. They had both died many years before this painting was made. So Giuliano had died, he'd been assassinated in the Pazzi Conspiracy in 1478 and Simonetta had died of tuberculosis in 1476. This painting is thought to have been in the middle of the 1480s, so it was about eight years after they were both killed. However, there are some fairly strange things surrounding Simonetta's death. She was just 22 when she died and she was known as a great beauty. A lot of the paintings that were made that were thought to be of her look really similar to this painting and they also think that paintings such as The Birth of Venus or some of the other Botticelli works are based on Simonetta's beauty. When she died at the age of 22, she was paraded through Florence in an open-topped coffin and all the passers-by said that she was more beautiful in death than she even had been alive. There was also a bit of a strange cult surrounding her death. Lots of poets, including Lorenzo de' Medici, wrote a poem about her beautifulness. And the reason why a lot of people think that maybe her and Giuliano had an affair was because during a celebration for a treaty between Venice and Milan, Giuliano chose her as his lady during a joust. This expression of courtly love is often read as an affair between the two of them. However, this is fairly unlikely because Giuliano actually had a mistress, Fionetta Gorini, who produced his son Giulio, as shown in Medici, and that Giulio went on to become the Pope, Pope Clement VII. So yes, if Simonetta and Giuliano had been having an affair, it would probably have been public knowledge, much like this affair with his son's mother. Thanks very much for watching this. Um, there's just a few things I'd like to say about this painting. One of them is that this is an extra layer for the painting, but it would have seemed like a really funny joke that a man would fall asleep straight after sex. So that's something to bear in mind. It's sort of a universal joke, it still works today as it did then, and it's something Florentines would have found really funny. Another thing is, I've been looking at the painting and I've noticed that there's a staff that Mars is leaning on, and the only thing I can find that's even similar, I looked up battle costumes from the Florentine Renaissance, and there doesn't seem to be anything much like it, apart from one of Botticelli's earlier works of Fortitude. So he painted the seven virtues, and the only one to be holding something like this, which is much more ornate, is Fortitude. So I presume that this staff, whatever it is, is based on Fortitude, and presumably Mars is meant to be strong and brave and like Fortitude, but obviously in this moment he has sort of surrendered to Venus. <laughs> anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. Please do like, subscribe, and turn on your notification bell if you'd like to see more. Thanks very much. I'll be back with more on the Medici and hopefully Botticelli in the next few weeks. See you soon. Bye!